Are we ready, Laura? Yes. All right. Well, I would like to welcome everyone to the November 21st meeting of the Community Resources Committee. Uh, my name is Garrick Perry. I'm the chair. And Laura, I would like to call this meeting to order so we can do a roll call. Okay. Councillor Perry. Here. Councillor Elkins. Here. Councillor Jarrett. Here. Councillor Mayori is not present. All right. Um, with that being said, we are doing a hybrid meeting, so we are, do have people here, but I want to let everyone know who is joining us online that this meeting will be video and audio recorded, so take note of that. Um, with that being said, we are now on the public comment section of our meeting, so if there are any public comments, please raise your hand and we will address you. Well, I do not see any uh, hands for public comment, so we will move on to the next item, which is approving minutes of the previous meetings. Uh, I will accept a motion to approve these minutes. Move to approve. Second. Laura, we take a roll call. Or do we need a roll call? For you? I guess not. Okay. <laughs> yes, I approve. I say all in favor. All in favor. Oh, sorry. I. Yeah, I. There we go. I. And that is passed we're very well trained i know this is our first time right here <laughs> um moving onward our next is updates and announcements from committee members so if anyone has any updates or announcements during this holiday season come forward uh, i did want to ask will you be describing i know this is the first of three is that right i we might we will have something you'll you'll talk yeah. about that okay great <clears throat> All right, with no updates, then we'll move on to the reason why we are here. Uh, we are very pleased to have today a roundtable discussion on topics relating to housing needs. Uh, this has been um, an issue on my mind, as well as a lot of people in the community. And so today is a chance for both the counselors and some of the public to come to a common understanding, some of the housing needs, uh, some of the issues that we are dealing with here in Northampton that are unique to us. And so we have brought together a uh, who's who of all stars in the housing world here to discuss everything from construction to costs and uh, you know market stresses here. I will uh, say that this is a broad issue. So we will be talking about this for more than one meeting. I'm uncertain whether or not our next meeting will be on housing because we might have to deal with some other issues, but please stay tuned as we move forward having these discussions. Um, with that being said, I would move over to Carolyn um, Mish, and I know that she has prepared a video for us. Thanks, Councillor Perry. Um, I guess first, um... I um, I think I know all of you, but wow. it might make sense to do a round of introductions because we have guests here and, and people out in Zoom world probably don't know um, these folks. So um, before, as you just sort of to lead off from where you started about the broad spectrum of sort of the economic picture of housing, um, I'll just start out by saying that, you know, we've heard a lot and the counselors have heard a lot about issues within the market, about the cost of housing and whether, um, you know, the direction that we've taken in terms of zoning is is resulting in, in housing that is uh, meeting our intentions and whether or not, you know, the because of those costs, particularly of single family homes, but also all unit construction costs are so high that um, maybe we need to reevaluate where we're going. So we wanted to make sure that we brought um, the discussion and brought some facts to bear and, and make sure that we're all talking from the same page and understanding what these issues um, you know, what's what the role of all of these different facets of the economy um, play in housing and housing construction and where we might go um, to support that and, and sort of um, what it means for um, our view of what 
starter homes are, whether we need to still think of those terms as starter homes for single family or if these starter homes or entry level homes are really more like um, smaller units or multifamily condominium type units as opposed to trying to build um, single family homes to get people into the into the market. Um, so to that end, I thought it made sense to, um, and in speaking with the counselors, that we sort of bring people who are experts in that field. So I'm going to, if, maybe if we go in a circle and just do quick introductions and- We yeah. start to your right. Great. Right. Oh, yeah. Scott Kiter. Oh. I'm Scott Kiter. I live in Florence and I own Kiter Corporation. Hello, uh, my name is Roger Cooney, and uh, I actually live in Haydenville in Donna Williamsburg, um, but I'm employed by Wright Builders. Um, I'm a director of special projects there, and thanks for the invitation to be here tonight. Thank you. We are still new at this. Okay. Yeah. I'm Rachel Simpson. I'm a licensed real estate broker at Maple and Main Realty. I am often mistaken for a native, but I've only lived here for 53 years and I live in Florence. Thank you. Uh, just hold it down. I'm Laura Baker. Uh, I'm the real estate. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, <laughs> I'm Catherine Ratte. I manage the Land Use and Environment Department at the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Um, and we serve, we do the housing planning as well the, the, within our Land Use and Environment Department. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you all for joining us. And so I think what we had talked about was um, showing a video that the we that Pioneer Valley Planning Commission helped us helped us put together earlier this year that talks about sort of gives the overview of, about housing um, in Northampton. And Laura, if you can screen share that, that would be great. And then everybody should mute for this to work. I think, yeah, you're muted. If there isn't housing, then nothing else really matters. If you don't have a roof over your head, everything else is secondary after that. Housing is becoming increasingly unavailable and unaffordable oh. across the board. For Hampshire County alone, we're looking at a housing unit deficit of in the order of 3,500 units by 2025. We worry about students, we worry about lower income individuals finding housing, but we also worry about people earning the median income, people earning above the median income still sometimes can't afford to get housing here. And so we're trying to think about how do we fill all those different niches. It's really important for us to expand our housing choice so that everyone who wants to live in Northampton can live in Northampton, and those that do live here now can stay here. We want Northampton to be for everybody. We have a kind of authenticity to almost the entire city that many, many places in this country have only in a very small part or not at all. Part of that success comes with it, this feeling that we have such a great neighborhood here, if we change it, it's gonna be ruined. And I, I think people have an idea that there's some kind of inherent fragility to the neighborhoods, when in fact, it's the exact opposite. It's, it's the fact that these are very strong neighborhoods with people who have been there for a long time that will allow those neighborhoods to absorb a vast array of types of changes. You want a city to evolve. Um, the last thing you want is for there to be stasis because then you have a city that's dying. What you want is things to constantly be moving and changing and adapting to where you are in history. We are trying to provide opportunities through a regulatory structure to allow the development of smaller
We're calling attainable housing, and so that in that way people can enter into the market and then build equity. If you can build a house that's 800 feet or 1,200 square feet instead of 2,500 square feet, the cost is less. It's not just, you know, allow a bunch of stuff by right, but take that next step and start saying, okay, what can we as a city provide residents that, that can help them to that next level, that can break down those barriers to then allow us to get housing, frankly, for a heck of a lot cheaper than any large scale development. A lot of people's reaction against new development is about the details. So we're really working hard on thinking about the details, trying to leverage money, grant monies we get, other sources to improve sidewalks trying to up this, the design standards for new homes that do fit in. One of the most important things is to create more housing for families that really need it and have it be somewhere where they're part of the fabric of our community instead of always pushing people out. Um, it's, it's important to try and bring everyone together. Awesome. Thank you for that. <clears throat> and thanks for putting that together and sharing that, Carolyn. Yep. Um, I think that now, if there oh, isn't how, sorry, uh, we can move. I know that you had uh, a brief discussion. You and Councillor Elkins were going to discuss some terms. Yeah, I thought we, um, by way of introduction and to pipe in here, uh, I have, uh, you know, come to City Council by way of the planning board first. And so in zoning, uh, zoning issues, housing issues, been a big, uh, was frankly a big part of you know, what I ran on and, and and the kind of things I wanted to keep working on. So I've been excited about this meeting and um, to kind of uh, looking forward um, to, you know, what how we imagine these conversations about zoning and housing um, and development in the city um, going forward is, you know, today, um, I think what we're, you know, hoping to hear about is sort of the market forces and, and things that go into, um, you know, how things get developed, why things get developed, why, um, you know, why uh, some of the zoning um, reforms that we've passed, uh, the city has passed over in the last uh, several years, of course, across, you know, uh, you know, three mayoral administrations and I don't know, eight or 10 council uh, terms, uh, you know, city councils. Um, What's working? What is perhaps not? What is um, what is facilitating and furthering the goals and um, the city's um, sus sustainability and reliability plans, um, and some of the goals that we've been talking about in terms of developing more housing, doing it in a sustainable and uh, resilient way, and um, and meeting the goals of the future. So, um, so today's I think uh, mostly focused on sort of the market forces and the and the reality, of the real estate. Uh, uh, market and and how we find ourselves in this housing situation. We're hoping um, in the future meetings to touch more on issues around um, sustainability, building uh, building sustainably and with resilience um, and protection of the uh, environment. Um, and uh, and this may go into two to three meetings, but we're also talk want to talk about um, historic conversation conservation down the road when some of uh, consulting work that the city is being has going on, um, we look for that to be um, completed down the road so that we can begin to talk about that um, and uh, some other issues around zoning and some of the form-based zoning reforms that we've done and um, some issues that, that folks, local folks are raising uh, and concerns around the development in their neighborhoods. So with that said, um, what we were hoping, uh, what care, uh, uh, Carolyn and I had talked about um, was, and I apologize, I'm looking at my phone because my computer has fully, completely died. Uh, so I'm not being rude and I'm just reading this, my notes from my phone. Um, we wanted to start with um, briefly, um, just a, a little back and forth uh, to make sure that we're all on the same page about some uh, terms that have some pretty significant implications uh in this how in this area and housing so um i will i'm just gonna kind of we'll just have a little bit of back and forth sure. um one thing um carolyn that i know consistently comes up is the discussion about the difference between affordable housing and then there's uh, uh we've had i know this the planning department and other folks we spoke with have 
of ways of of talking about market rate housing and you know so we've heard about attainable housing and things like that can you talk a little bit about the distinction between what constitutes affordable housing versus market rate or attainable housing or some of the other terms that we use sure. um so when we talk about affordable housing and we often hear as part of the conversation people are saying that now homes are not affordable to um to them so we're not building affordable housing affordable housing has a very distinct um, definition and i know laura um, baker is going to talk about sort of their piece in that and the costs associated with that but it really is um restricted to people meeting certain income levels so it, it's and it's defined um federal and state um uh guidelines say you know affordable housing is that housing that's um targeted for meeting uh the needs of people who are earning 80 percent or less of the area median income and so that's going to be and that those folks are not paying more than 30 percent of their income towards housing and so the the um sector of the community that meets that is very regulated and it doesn't and and so um when we talk about affordable housing we want to make sure that that's sort of that's what we're defining as that's um typically um almost 100 percent subsidized housing in some form or other usually by state and federal funds and and um, market rate housing or what we're trying to um, address is that level above 80% of the area median income. So people who are making incomes that are higher than those that are targeted for subsidized housing, but still can't afford to buy in or find housing, even rental housing in Northampton. And so we've um, to variously talked about this as workforce housing or market rate um, uh, affordable housing, but it's what we're really trying to say is we want to um, think about housing that all anyone else who's not eligible for this subsidized housing has the ability to find housing at their income level, whatever they're looking for, whatever their comfort level is. Um, and that number has changed over the years. Obviously, when you know people think about when they bought in 10, 20, 30 years ago, and now looking at the numbers for getting into housing, the it's um, just an astronomical difference. And so I think that's hard for people to understand um, what the new market is. So that's what I think this whole conversation is about, to talk about those factors. Um, Garrett, do you want to... Uh, walk us through our speakers or do you want me to do that uh, you can do that if you would like okay you might, you might, you might have more uh, of an understanding of who they are as long as folks don't uh and also carolyn i'll ask you to pipe in as uh, yeah. as 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 needed so um we so the folks that we brought um we have uh want to hear from folks about a number of things i don't know if if there was any discussion about a order uh per se, but I'm just gonna go in the order of this uh, outline of notes um, that I have. So um, we have um, Catherine, um, say your last Rate. Rate, um, um to talk about um, some of the market conditions and, uh, you know, re and regional issues about where we are uh, regional. So I'm gonna kick off to you. Okay. Um, and we may have some questions as we go forward. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Um, so the uh, UMass Donahue Institute, a bunch of organizations in the last couple of years came together in our region to understand the housing crisis, because we we are having a housing crisis, obviously, in our region, in the Commonwealth, in the country, in the world. And um, we collected some money and hired the Donahue Institute. It was Wayfinders, it was the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, it was the Community Foundation of Western Mass and the Franklin Regional Council of Governments. And I can't remember if I'm leaving anybody out, but I'm gonna be referring to a lot of these um, information and I'll send the links to Carolyn so you can all look at this. But so again, as you all know and why we're here, housing is one of the most pressing and complicated policy and economic issues that Massachusetts faces today. Concerns over housing affordability, access, availability, and market pressures all have outsized impacts on residents' quality of life. And that's why uh, we brought in the Donahue Institute to do this study and, and get the numbers for us. So we have a lot of numbers. Um, it, regionally speaking, over the past decade, the Pioneer Valley, we've seen minimal population growth. 
um, this gets at some of the issues that Carolyn was talking about. In Franklin County, they've actually lost population um, since 2010. And projections for the next five years show the population over age 60 is expected to grow, which will in turn cause an increase in demand for housing as an aging population generally requires more housing units per person than younger households. So basically, we're looking if housing production levels remain at the levels that they're at, we need 19,000 to 20,000 new units in the Pioneer Valley by 2025. And it's 2022, it's almost over. So we have we have only a couple of years. We have a, we have a ridiculous challenge um, that we're facing. And I'm looking forward to how all of, all of the rest of you are gonna tell us how we're gonna solve it. Um, but economic disparities by race and ethnicity appear to be, are, are obviously getting worse in the region. In 2013, the median white family income was $78,000, while black and Latino media, median family incomes for black median family incomes were $41,000, and Latino median family incomes, $28,000, again, compared to the $78,000 for the um, white uh, median family income. By 2018, the white median family income had jumped to $94,000. But the black and Latino family incomes had only increased by 3,000 each. These income disparities contribute to unequal access to homeownership, as well as a significant rent burden for lower income households, which are often households of color in our region. And rent burden has remained consistent for renters, even in the economic recovery from the Great Recession. And it's a common problem throughout the Commonwealth, but it's very much of a burden here. So in the basic the basic numbers are demographically we're we're not growing um and the growth has varied but it's we're not doing very well we are getting increasingly diverse our 60 plus population is growing which is a, another demand for housing economically we recovered slower from the 2008 recession than the rest of the commonwealth we have higher levels of unemployment we have slower growth in employment and we have a delayed recovery in home prices um so the labor force participation rate fell as aging residents retired and left the workforce. Um, and again, so when you're talking about housing affordability, it's what you got to have an income. It's what you, you got to have an income to be able to afford a house. Um, in housing, half of all renters in the Pioneer Valley are housing cost burdened. And we define that as paying 30% or more of your income for your housing. This high cost burden is stubbornly persistent. It has remained almost the same since 2010. And that's something that obviously is, is what you guys are, we're all going to be trying to understand. Um, the incidence of cost burden is much lower for homeowners, not surprisingly, or maybe it is surprising, but um, you get in early. And the, the problem is in our region, people of color rent at higher rates in the region. Black and Hispanic households own their homes at less than half the rate of the Pioneer Valley's white population. And accordingly, people of color are more housing cost burdened. And again, on average, older people tend to live with fewer people per unit. So as we get older, we need more units. Um, and our housing stock is old, which further reduces the number of units that are desirable, available, or in some cases, um, even functionally habitable. So, um, we have 10% of Massachusetts rental units, but 15% of the state's rent income mismatch. In other words, one in six of all apartments in the Commonwealth that are financially out of reach are in the Pioneer Valley because of our mismatch. Um, and this is despite having only 10% of the state's total rental units. Um, this can be addressed through support of development of owned and rented homes. So we just have to build. We have to get more building, which again is what we're here to talk about what you all are doing. Um, we need, I said 19,000 from the first part of the study was done in 21. By the time we finished, or in 20 to 21, by the time we finished it, we said we need 20,000. We need 20,000 new hounding units overall in our region. And the solution is a regional approach to housing. Um, the solution is all the stuff that you guys are doing, but um, Rural, suburban, and urban issues face different issues in housing development. Rural areas have high costs of adding infrastructure that isn't yet present, water, sewer, internet, while suburban areas have restrict, often have restrictive zoning or other reasons that are limiting buildable lots, including neighbor resistance, being somewhat built out, high redevelopment costs because of existing structures, um, and uh, in high poverty areas, there could be decay of the building property that, that requires additional cost for redevelopment. So in terms of policy solutions, um, the cost of housing relative to job prospects 
has the potential to cause dramatic depopulation, eroding both the tax base and the presence of economically vital segments of the population. In suburban areas, housing pressure can cause prices to skyrocket and threaten community well-being with stagnation and out-of-reach homes. Economic housing cost pressure has also resulted in extremely high present-day levels of segregation across the region. The specific policy intuitions for action to restore more equity include increased rent and construction resources, as well as support to first-time and lower-income buyers, shared regional building goals, infrastructure resources for roads and sewers in addition to broadband. We need increased state-level policy flexibility and resources, and we need to update municipal bylaws ordinances as Northampton is doing, while reinvigorating resident support for inclusive regulations and growth for the benefit of all our communities across the income spectrum. Continued local zoning, <coughs> excuse me, local zoning reform to allow more homes in more places across our communities, especially to allow higher density, multifamily structures and accessory dwelling units known as ADUs are what we need. And again, that's the, the, the approach that Northampton has been taking, which is you know so exciting. Um, construction of additional naturally occurring affordable housing. Carolyn was talking about there's subsidized housing, there's affordable housing that the government regulates, but then there's naturally occurring affordable housing and that's attainable housing. That's what we need. We need um, more construction of units, affordable units for rent and for ownership in and outside urban centers in, throughout our region to maximize more affordable affordability across all income levels, <clears throat> excuse me, to make more communities accessible to a wider variety of people, to decrease regional segregation, and hopefully increase place-based opportunities to a wider group of community members. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do you have questions for say, or any of the counselors have questions? I, I think we should wait to the end for questions if everyone is okay. I, I would. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. Um, um, so um, we also have uh, here the next, if we could hear, which I kind of to springboard from yours of we need to build more houses. Um, I toss it to Roger Cooney um, and uh well, we'll stick with Roger Roger for right now, although I would invite um, Scott to pipe in um, on these issues, because um, we're hoping to hear more about, um, uh, actually, both of you are listed for these things, um, issues around the building, the cost of building, um, stretch the stretch code and its effect uh, here. Um, we're also hoping to hear your thoughts about tree replacement and density restrictions and and so forth. Well, thank you again. Um, I think I'm, I'm going to start with sort of a 10,000 foot view and then kind of boil down into some uh, other items. And then uh, through Q&A, I think it would probably be pretty useful. Um, so uh, jumping in, I think, you know, if we sort of look at these drivers, uh, meaning costs relative to building and the market and what it's doing locally, nationally, locally, regionally, um, and, and how that compares to say uh, a 50 year time span, right? Um, we're uh, experiencing sort of anomalies in the last couple of years, but just talking broadly, um, according to the US Bureau of Labor and Statistics from 1967 till now, uh, we've seen nationally almost a 900% increase in construction costs. So that's uh, you know based on data that they've gathered, uh, and it's a pretty large database over that time. Um, nationally, the average increase year to year is about four percent, four point two two, and and that's pretty consistent to what we're we've seen in Western Massachusetts. Let's say in the last um, couple of decades, where on average we're in that two to three percent year over year, some years five percent. Uh, but locally now, uh, since COVID and the pandemic, um, we've been seeing as much as twelve percent year over year, um, and that's pretty consistent. And it's certainly more towards the commercial side of of building, but 
uh, residential is affected by that as well. And so um, that's a pretty significant change over two and a half year period. Um, and Scott and I can tell you all the horror stories about, you know, what we've experienced in the last couple of years in terms of the drivers or the cause and effect of what what has, you know, pushed those percentages, pushed those costs up. Um, the other sort of big picture is that um, Massachusetts is probably somewhere in the top five of housing, most expensive housing in the continental U.S., including Hawaii. Um, we're, depending on what statistic you look at, we're sort of in the third or fourth or fifth position, uh, you know, a claim to fame that we probably don't want. But um, nonetheless, uh, Hawaii is the, is the top, number one, kept followed by California and Wyoming, depending on what, you know, data set you look at. Um, and uh, and Washington is sort of in that number three position, or we are a third or four. So not that we're competing for that, you know, top slot, but um, we'll come back to Wyoming or sort of a, a piece about Wyoming that drives up their costs is their lack of workforce, people to actually build buildings. And we'll come back to that in a minute. So, so that's just kind of general atmosphere that we're operating in. Um, and I think one of the questions that, um, you know, Carolyn, you pose and others have talked about is if I'm that homeowner who's been in the Pioneer Valley or been in Northampton and had bought my home, you know, 50 years ago or 30 years ago, or whatever that time frame is, and now we're and now we're faced, they we are faced with the sticker shock as to, you know, I bought my house for this amount of money. Why is it three, two or three or four, maybe five fold costs over what I paid, you know, not two decades ago? And so um, that's just sort of a segue into um, what what we're seeing um, locally. Land costs are a factor, right? And sometimes that's sometimes that's within the building construction costs, and sometimes it's not. That prospective homeowner who wants to build maybe has already acquired that property, or they want want assistance with sort of putting that together. Um, so that. The, the real costs and others can speak to that probably more d detail in terms of what those costs have increased over time. But um, um, lack of housing uh, is a big driver and we've already articulated that and we're, you know, we're not in a vacuum. Um, cost of doing business from a business perspective, from a construction building perspective um, has, has many items that are affecting costs that, you know, essentially are a cost of doing business. Um, lack of skilled labor, the Wyoming lack of people, and it's not un unlike here where um, there are not a lot of people coming into specific um, aspects or divisions of the work, uh, framers, for example, or finished carpenters or so on. And there, as an aside, there are programs that are helping bring those folks along um, they tend to be more in the electrical, plumbing, HVAC realm. Um, and so there's real challenges in terms of uh, what's called rough carpentry framing and those kinds of things. So finding that or training that skilled force and keeping them in place um, goes to the next bit. And that is that um, in order to maintain those folks within your building uh, world in terms of your business, what are you paying those folks to retain them? What are you spending to train them? Um, and it's a highly competitive marketplace. And so lack of is that supply and demand. It's pretty fundamental. Um, but moreover, in our view, there's a shift from a living wage to, to an income that actually allows you to support your family, to allow you to buy in and buy home, um, rather than just you know, maybe some decades ago where it was you're just getting by and somehow people in certain trades were sort of not second class citizens, but there's sort of a stratification. My son or daughter, you know, became a doctor or a lawyer or whatever. And how often did they say my son became a plumber or a carpenter or an electrician? So from our perspective, it's way overdue that that wage for those folks doing that work complicated work, technically complicated work, huge liabilities around that work ought to, ought to have a fair share. And so I'll uh, 
I'll get off my soapbox for a second, but there it is. Um, the other drivers for us, cost in terms of doing business are health, dental, retirement, et cetera, et cetera, insurances, um, overhead of a you know the office, a vehicle fleet, fuel costs that are constantly accelerating, insurances, taxes, and on and on and on, right? Um, just to keep the lights on and keep the doors open. So that's sort of kind of a baseline of a of a business picture, right? Not unlike other businesses. Um, then there are when you get down to the bricks and the blocks and the and the two by fours and so on and so forth. Um, all those costs have, particularly in the last two and a half years, have been exponential. When COVID first arrived, we were seeing costs over, you know, short periods of time, fifty percent increase, hundred percent increase, two hundred. It's um, shipping costs, for example, for materials that come overseas, from overseas. Um, up to almost 500% increase in those shipping costs. That's, you know, big boxes and tankers coming across the ocean from wherever they come from. So very significant. That number is getting better, but, um, you know, you hear the adage, the supply and demand, but you also hear the term that Scott and I really don't want to hear anymore, hear anymore and that's supply chain issues. It seems to be uh, a, a worn out, um, but, it's a real thing. Um, and concrete examples for us in our world is, you know, if you're putting in a 400 amp service into a new home, try and find that metal box that that meter goes on that's approved by the utility is like, it's like hen's teeth as the expression goes, right? Um, if you're in the commercial realm and you want large switch gear and those kinds of things, big, big pieces of electrical equipment as a concrete example, you could be waiting for that for a year, calendar year or more. Um, so, uh, regionally, there's in New England, there's one metal roofing distributor, one. So their competition isn't there. And so that's not to say that they're taking advantage of the market, but, you know, you have those kind of challenges. Glass, which is manufactured, one large manufacturer in the continental U.S. Is, uh, supplies all the major brands and the minor brands. Um, and they're backed up, you know, and this kind of goes that that recurring cycle of lack of workforce and so on the COVID costs. And so that's the current environment. Will that get better over time? We certainly hope so. Do we see um, some of that volatility in the market go away? We have. Um, so that's, this just kind of gives you a little bit of content and some concrete examples of the insider view. Um, the other piece that you've talked about and we can elaborate on, and I'm just gonna kind of go through those items is, um, zoning local zoning and and code requirements zoning and so on and also uh building code whether it's international building code or mass adopted building codes those are items that are of great import they're largely based on you know public health and safety um and they're really important and so do those drive up costs uh, do you want your building to burn down or do you want somebody to die on your watch probably not and so they're 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 sort of endemic and baked into what ought to be happening um, as in best practices. And bear in mind that building codes are minimal standards. And so, you know, we build to a good standard based on lots of good data, um, but we can go beyond that, of course. Energy code and stretch code is part of that, and you've talked about it. Um, Scott's heard me say this before, stretch code is not a stretch for us or him. And, uh, you know, there's some concerns about costs related to that somehow driving up costs. And I would argue that they actually save money. While that initial cash outlay, so-called first cost might be higher, um, the recovery of that cost through heating and cooling over time will pay for itself tenfold. So um, there's also a moral imperative there and I'm back on my salt box again, and we could talk about this in another session. I would love the opportunity to talk to you about uh, sustainable, uh, building and uh, those kinds of things. So point being that um, these are important things for us, for our livelihoods, for our families, for the planet. Um, density is something you've intimated about you know, zoning and, you know, smaller lots and higher density and, and so on. Um, and there may be some voices out there that feel that that um, isn't a good thing. We can talk about that and why we think it is a good thing. Um, moreover, um, 
as my grandfather said, and you've heard it, he didn't coin this, they're not making any more land. <laughs> All right. So um, as opposed to, you know, you must have a minimal frontage of X and a, a square footage of Y, and you you wonder why, you know, there isn't a place to build a home for somebody. Other items that drive cost to some extent, wetland permitting, important. Stormwater management, important. Groundwater protection overlay districts, important. Flood zones, probably don't want to build in those. Um, or if you do, you want to do it the right way. Um, tree replacement in the city's ordinance and caliper size and so on. While a cost, um, it is a cost that affects overall building. But what are the drivers? Again, what, what's the reasoning behind doing that? Um, in our world, with the city, with the zoning ordinances, in fact, if we show that we can generate more electricity vis-a-vis -vis, uh, you know, electric generation on site, um, you're not, you don't have to replace those trees. And so that carbon offset is, is made up there. Site development to what you alluded to earlier um, is you know, access, water, sewer, power, tell data, so on. And if it's rural, private septic, private well, and so on, all, all are big costs. Um, so last, lastly is, um, and there's some graphics here that I, that I set forward and, and share, we can be shared is, um, if you look at interest rates over time, how, how much is that affecting purchasing power and affordability and so on? And, and I would argue that it's, um, we've enjoyed a, a low rates over some time, um, and they are inching back up, but you don't have to look very, very far back to see when interest rates were 10, 12, 14, 16, 18%, depending on. And so there's there's plenty of information for the wonky ones in the room, and I would be one of them um, to sort of these things. So, um, yeah, uh, happy to get into a Q&A. Thank you. Scott, do you have anything you'd add? I agree with everything Roger said. <laughs> um, I, I didn't come prepared with data uh, on purpose, but I thought I'd share one thing with the with the group. Um, <clears throat> we I think we constructed six or seven houses in the 2021 time period. We're not most of our work is commercial and institutional, um, but we have seen just a total stoppage of that kind of work coming through the door. Uh, not, not surprisingly, given the interest rates and the economic climate um, or, the, or the banking and financing climate. Um, but as we were starting, we had a number of clients that moved on. Uh, we started second guessing our own costs. This was probably about three months ago. So I ran a, I had my team analyze a house that we constructed in 2014, just outside of Beaverbrook in Leeds. And we built that house 2,300 square feet with what I would consider to be above average finishes for just around $400,000. That put it at around $185 a square foot, not including the land, the client owned the land. Uh, we we can't even come close to doing a house like that for under eight eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and that's eight years ago. So uh, we're you know we we run the numbers every which way, sideways, up, down, left, right, and our margins, if anything, are going down as a general contractor. Uh, and so just to um, follow up a couple of the things Roger brought up, you know, we're the some of these things you see in the news every day i mean we we are not in a vacuum right so we're we're competing with the same glass as a company in california or or anywhere else in our country um but there is an absolute labor shortage in our industry a qualified labor shortage um material supply chain constraints is the one <laughs> we can't stand to hear anymore um the subcontractors have exactly the same problems, okay? And they're at, their problems are actually worse because they're looking for craftsmen in their respective trade. Um, but, you know, what, what nobody really seems to talk about is what do all those, you know, it's not just the labor and the increased wages or, you know, the fact that you're 
getting squeezed, you know, with supply. It's all the incremental creep, right? So the cost for, for us to build a house that took six months, five years ago, may take 10 months now. Where's all that money go? Because I have to run a business. So the portable toilet's there for four more months, um, you name it. The whole project is being extended. And furthermore, um, we can't plan anything. You know, the the schedule looks great on paper and it's literally not a day goes by where we're getting news of something not going right. And so you need to shift and recalibrate everything. And that means cha-ching. Every time you do that, you're having people remobilize and uh, your your clients are getting upset. And it's a really difficult, the last two years, two to three years have been very difficult to keep it all on the, on the rails. Um, I personally bought a, a fixer upper house on Chesterfield Road. My wife, Jill, and I <clears throat> uh, needed a lot of work. We uh, were able to leverage the new zoning regulations to subdivide a piece of land off of that house. We did minimal work on the house by design. A uh, couple of women who were just out of college were able to afford that house. And then we built a nice, beautiful, brand new home next door. I'm an advocate for the urban infill. I think, um, you know, again, I, I don't, I would never, I'm not qualified to get into the um, macroeconomics of everything here, but just intuitively to me living in town, if the more opportunities we have to add any housing, uh, the better off we are as a community uh, because, you know, I, all of us know, countless people who can't seem to get into Northampton. And then there's, of course, the people in Northampton who can't afford to sell because they have nowhere to go. Um, and as Roger said, they're not making any more land. So, you know, whether you're putting qualified low-income housing or, excuse me, affordable housing or a housing that's affordable or a housing that's in, the, I'm sorry, the range that you had brought up or even more premium, it's still housing. And I think uh, given that we need 20,000 units in the next three years, we're going to get to work right away. <laughs> um, you know, we need to be creative as a community to find land to do that. Um, the, the inventory is does need is getting tired as from what I can see just driving down the road. Um, so I think, you know, there's uh, there's that you want to make sure that we're reinvesting in the buildings that still have life in them. Um, I, you, certainly your money is going to go further that way. Um, but I also think we need to um, really get creative about, and I think the community, I think Carolyn and her team are doing that. I think we're, you know, when, when you're trying to put a new house on to meet the zoning, you, you really got to make sure it's, it's, if you're subdividing a small lot, you have to be very creative with how, how you're meeting the facade requirements and all the setback and open space and all of that. Um, so I think I think Northampton's doing a great job of of walking the line between just building uh, you know houses that don't fit um, and making space you know for guys like us to come in and and, and build things. Um, and one other thought, but it's escaped me. So I think that's it. And again, you know, more than anything, I I. Uh, volunteered to um put myself out there just to help answer any questions uh so if anything um i'm open even outside of this arrangement to uh to help answer anything that i possibly can if i don't know the answer i know guys like roger and and others who i think would be happy to chime in thank you all right very good um which leads us to um, Laura Baker uh, to talk about cost for affordable housing. I think at this point, we all should grab our buckets and get ready to uh, for the nausea that is going <laughs> to, I just, after that discussion, I'm, I got to say, I'm not looking forward, Laura, to your, <laughs> what you have to say, but well, well please, please do go, please do. You know, we're swimming in the same basically pond as these guys, and I will just say I wouldn't wish it on anybody. Um, it has been a brutal couple of years in your business, and I'm 
concerned, honestly, that people will be exiting because it is very stressful or retiring out of this system because it's become a really, really hard way to make a living. Um, so I think that's something we should all be concerned about. Um, so I was asked to talk a little bit maybe about the costs related to building affordable housing as opposed to other types of housing. Um, the irony is people often think that affordable housing should be affordable to build or develop, um, and it, 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 it isn't. That's the that's the headline. Um, the affordability comes in uh, the cost to the tenant or the home buyer of the housing, um, not in the creation of the housing. Um, so there are some kind of basic things that we do in the affordable housing sector that actually drive our costs up potentially uh, above or to compete with uh, market rate costs. So I will tell you what some of those are just so that you're informed. Um, the state of Massachusetts, God love them. They're, they like to tell us, you know, they're, it's a regu highly regulated state. Um, and so when we go to build affordable housing, they want it to be really good. Um, as does Northampton. So we are dictated uh, size of units, size of rooms, number of feet of countertop, number of bedrooms, what the cabinets are made of. So it's, it's, it's a very prescribed type of building. Um, we need to meet a very high level of handicapped accessibility. Um, and typically that means we're putting elevators in wherever we go because we need the vertical access. Um, the state is also like the city, very interested in green building and energy efficiency. Uh, they're interested in site amenities and they're very interested in location as we are as well for our tenants. So we serve tenants who often do not have their own uh, private transportation. So we are looking to be central and near transit, which tends to be some of your more expensive um, land or buildings to purchase. Um, our work takes a very long time. It's taking longer now because of what these gentlemen just talked about. Um, so I used to say when I started this job that it would be three to five years between when we were planning to leasing, you know, starting to plan housing to leasing up housing. I now say it's five to seven years. Um, we have a building uh, that just finished construction, actually, that I've been working on in Sunderland um, that took nine years. It's all done but no one can live in it because we're missing an electrical panel. Um, so, <laughs> so there's that stuff. Um, but one of the things that takes affordable housing longer to develop is the permitting, because often we are using some kind of specialized zoning permits. Um, we do need to raise money from many different sources, and that takes a while to do. Um, in our sector, soft costs, which is the part of the building that isn't the construction, um, tends to be higher. It's about 25% of the total development cost. So there are more attorneys um, more uh, environmental specialists and things like that that get involved. Um, there are tax credit syndicators. Uh, we do uh, a lot of work around marketing and tenant lotteries and tenant screening that wouldn't necessarily happen in, in the true market. Um, so the, the result of all of this as Scott was saying, the square foot cost for us to build right now, when I put together a budget, I am looking in the $350 to $400 per square foot range and, and white knuckling it <laughs> because I'm not sure it's enough. <laughs> um, so the per unit costs, uh, and this is statewide, we're being asked by the state to send them proposals wherein the per unit total development cost, which is everything. It's the land, it's the building, it's everything, stays below $500,000 per unit. So this could be an apartment building per unit. Um, and the state is seeing uh, that most people can't do that. So the eastern part of the state, their costs, they're seeing $750,000. they have seen projects come in at a million dollars per unit. So, and this is pretty new, like a couple of years ago, we were pretty comfortably at 300, 325,000. It was still shocking to the general public that it cost that much, but things have really changed over the last couple of years in terms of cost. 
one bright spot for us um, right now is the uh, ARPA money uh, that's coming, kind of finally coming down the pipeline, both to the state and to the city. This is the American Recovery Plan Act yes. money. Um, so there will be a lot of activity. Um, it's kind of an interesting time. There's a lot of money, but a short time to spend it. So it will be a, 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 a like a fire hose <laughs> for a couple of years, like three years. Um, we are trying to queue up all the projects we can. We are worried about supply chain and being able to deliver the units in the timeline that we're expected to deliver them. Uh, and I'm also concerned that after the ARPA money kind of slushes out into the environment, that we will look at a constriction in resources. And companies will be going out of business potentially. I think with the higher interest rates, and then once the ARPA kind of sluice way closes, what will the landscape look like for for builders? Um, I would love to talk about sustainability. I, I would like to talk about the city's um, all electric uh, fuel requirement because I think it has some pretty big implications. Don't need to do it tonight, but it is something we've got a close eye on, not only in terms of the building costs. So it's it's different than the the question of, you know, insulating a building well, which is a passive cost that you you invest up front and you you get that benefit long term. I feel like the all electric utilities um are proving more expensive to operate um over time. Hmm. Uh and that I, I see that increasing as we drive more and more business onto the grid. I think we're going to have a shortage of electricity. And so we'll see mounting costs there. Um, in affordable housing, uh, our operating costs are a bigger challenge than development costs. Because we have fixed rents, we're typically committing to them for a 99-year period. Um, so those rents don't go up. And lately, we've seen, obviously, a lot of inflation. And so we are... I would say about half the properties that Valley owns lose money every year. Some of them might make a little, but so how long is that sustainable is the question. Um, I think that's where I wanted to leave it. And I can turn it to Rachel. You gotta give me your mic. I'll give you my mic. Um, and so Rachel, indeed, uh, it doesn't hear her turn. Um, and uh, we are hoping um, to hear about the, the, the market. The cost of new and uh, resale and interest rates and all of those good things. Um, okay, I'll do my best. I am. Um, I'm passing around a handout, which is kind of depressing. Um, I hate to say. Um, there's enough I counted so everybody should do we have this uh, uh to share on the I, I emailed it okay. to Laura earlier um and I've been a realtor for for almost 10 years I um so I have that much experience I have I don't have the 20 to 30 years that some of the um you know other realtors have but I I have been the beneficiary of a lot of their um experience and knowledge and um collegiality so um i just wanted to say that while i may not have lived through some of the things that i may mention um i've certainly lived through what i think is is primarily important right now which is what's happened in the last four years and i'm i started when i started looking at data i started look looking in 2019 which was pre-covid and in two, and I can, I mean, I could go on for three hours. In fact, I practiced this speech and it was way too long. It wasn't <laughs> the five minutes I allotted or I was allotted. So it's, I've condensed it, but I have lots more data than I'm going to, um, than I'm going to, you know, share with you right now. Um, and it's all drawn from the multiple listing service, which is the, the database uh, that all realtors enter um, homes, you know, details about home, whether they're condos or multifamilies or, single family homes that they're going to sell. Um, and it's where all buyers, not well, Zillow is where everybody looks now, but Zillow pulls from the MLS. So this is all MLS driven data. Um, and the, the top chart is the price per square foot and comparing um, what the cost was, you know, between 2019 and this year to date um, for single family homes, condos and multifamilies. And 
um, this the second chart is how the list price compared to the compared to the sale price in those same years. And like the long and the short of it is that um, the impact of the pandemic and the influx of cash into, and I'm going to talk specifically about Northampton, has has had a a I mean, I guess for realtors who make our living, we make our, this is how we make our living. We're independent contractors. We have high expenses for health insurance and things like that. But um, it, the market's been great, but the guilt has been terrible. And, um, and it's, it's, it's been really, it's been really unusual. And in fact, some of those long-term realtors that I've spoken to about what's happened in the last several years have said they have never seen anything like it. We all agree that it's been a completely irrational market. And in 2019, the average cost per square foot for a single family home um, to, you know, at a, not to construct one, but one that was on the market and sold. So it, you know, could be new, could be old, was $214. This year, it's $296. And that's a pretty steep jump. The average cost, the average list price for a home in 2019, a single family home, was 400,000 and change. And it sold in 2019, typically for less than the list price. And every year since then, the average list price has gone up and the average sale price has gone up above the list price to the point where this year, um, I think the average list price is 517,000 and change. And the average sale price is 514,000 and change. And that's, a lot. I mean, that's a pretty steep climb. And um, so I had a lot of paragraphs that said all that. But <laughs> luckily, you don't have to listen to them. Um, but what what happened in 2019, the way that we bought and sold houses was more normal. Like we did inspections and we had, we had finance, people went to the bank and got financing and they could have a small down payment. And you could negotiate over inspections if there was something wrong with the house, like asbestos or um, knob and tube wiring or, you know, some of the more expensive repairs or some little repairs, um, radon, um, things like that. Um, in 2020, things started to change. They they continued to change through 2021 into 2022. 2021 is when we had the hugest influx of cash. Um, and actually... While we all perceived that the that the supply was low, the number of houses on the market increased every single year. There were there were 291 on the market in two th in 2019. There were 377 on the market in 2021, and that's a big jump. But the demand for housing outstripped the supply. So I guess technically the supply decreased if you were going to do it mathematically, but. Was actually a greater number of available houses, but the prices were higher and people couldn't compete against cash. And that's what we had. Um, and, and there was a progression where we started to see, you know, people started, people were so desperate for housing that they were waiving inspections or which is a, a terrible piece of advice um to give to anybody if you're a realtor because you, you don't know what you're buying and you don't know how what your future expenses are going to be but they you know it makes your offer more attractive to somebody who's looking to sell their house for the highest amount of money with the least amount of stress they were doing away if they were financed if by some chance they were um cash and not financed um they were waiving the appraisal contingency which meant that if the house appraised at less than the selling price they said they would make up the difference in cash. Not not too many people can do that. So those are the those are the those are the buyers who were buying these houses. You know, um, it's it, 2021 felt like the most intense year of that. Um, this year has been somewhat like that, but just in the late fall, we have started to see some kind of shift. Thank God some kind of return to normalcy. I've had, and I'm gonna speak anecdotally a little bit, um, I've put several houses under deposit for less than asking price, had regular inspections, and even gotten people to make concessions during inspection. And that 
was normal in 2019, it was an aberration for the last three years. Um, and I'm not the only one. I mean, we also are seeing more price changes. We're seeing more houses um, go under contract and come back on the market. We're seeing um, low, sort of low, a little bit lower prices to start with. We're seeing, in the cases of multiple offers, I would say mid this year, we started to see still multiple offer situations, but there were fewer multiple offers. We went from, from a place in 2021 where you would have something like 14 offers on just a little farmhouse on Oak Street to where we now maybe have two or three offers on a sort of regular house. Um, so, so now we just have a couple, or sometimes we just have one, you know, which is, is normal, but it doesn't feel normal anymore. Um, you know, like it was, a, it, it was, it's been a, it's been crazy. Um, and it's, you know, I don't, I don't think that we're really, uh, we're not going to know how much the market is correcting itself. Um, or how it's correcting itself until we see at least another year of data. Um, I mean, at least it's it's only been since late this fall that we've even started to, and that's as interest rates went up, which meant costs for buyers went up, um, that we started to see a return to something that was semi like not insane. And, um, you know, the unfortunate part of all this is that this, whatever our new normal is prices have escalated to a point that they're not gonna i don't think they're likely to come back down and and i'm not even thinking about building costs or those kinds of things it's just what happens in real estate after the subprime mortgage disaster um we didn't really see prices come down in northampton we saw fewer people wanting to sell their houses because they were scared but we didn't see prices come down um, I don't think we're going to see prices come. I mean, I'm not, I don't have a crystal ball or I would be president of everything, but, um, but I don't think we're going to see them come down. And that's, that's horrible um, for people who are trying to find a place to live. If my daughter ever decided that she could actually move back to the same town that her mother lives in, <laughs> which would be nice. Um, she couldn't buy a house here without a lot of help from me. Um, and one of the things Carolyn asked me to talk about was what's an entry, you know, about entry level homes and entry level homes used to be considered things like, you know, little ranches, little 960 square foot ranches or small capes. Um, and even those, you know, had bidding war after bidding war after bidding war after bidding war. And this year, and this is again anecdotal, but I think it speaks for the larger um, activity in the market. I know of three homes in Leeds. One was tiny. It was nice. It was tiny. The garage was falling down. It was super cute, but the ho the cabinets were like really hot. like I couldn't reach them. Um, and there were multiple offers, and it sold for over asking price. And that was late this year. So it was a tiny little house. It was an entry level home, had two bedrooms. And then two others in Leeds, both listed in the um, low threes, both very dated, both needed a lot of work, both had issues. Um, you know, as best, I don't know about these particular two houses, both had issues that needed addressing um, that went beyond cosmetic. And they still had multiple offers and they still went for over asking price. And that was late this year. And these were just little ranch houses, little ranch houses. People are, people are, have been willing just to get into a house. They've been willing to overlook scary things like asbestos in the basement. I, I don't, I can't tell you how many people who said, oh, you know, I know how to take that off by myself. And I'm like, oh my God. Um, the, the people are willing to do anything to get a house and the people who can afford those houses like the ones in Leeds are if they're younger people they've either gotten family money to help them or uh you know their grandmother left them some money or something they've got a cash influx coming from somewhere uh, uh you know first time home buyers where both people are working 
are getting creamed in this market. They can't afford to buy anything. And so they're looking, what, what I'm experiencing and what many of my colleagues are experiencing is that they're looking outside of Northampton. They're looking in, now that the Hilltowns all have fiber optic cable, they're looking in the Hilltowns because it's cheaper for now. It used to be cheaper to live in East Hampton than it was in Northampton, but not anymore. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's just, I don't know. And as far as Catherine, I mean, Carolyn also asked me to talk about financing. Um, I will say that um, I am really relieved that we are seeing financing more commonly than we had been for the last several years. Um, the problem with financing is if you have a low down payment, um, your offer is less attractive than someone who can put down 20% or more. If you can only put down 5%, and there are some great loans where that require a minimum down payment. There's VA loans that are 100% loans are great loans. They're reliable loans. Mass conventional 100% loans are great loans. They're reliable loans. And they don't give them, they just don't throw them out to anybody. They they make sure people are qualified. Um, but people, but sellers and their agents see those and get, you know, like, eh, you know, I'd rather take this one. You know, in, 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 in truth, the people who have those loans, maybe the people who are the most into buying that house and are going to do whatever they can to buy it, as opposed to the people who have the money to put down for a down payment, you know. So financing is an issue. The DREAMS program was great, but we didn't benefit from it because we weren't one of the towns that was um, picked. Um, what else was I going to say about this? You know, like I said before, the rise the rise in interest rates is making it so people can't afford, you know, they can they can they have to spend less now to to keep their monthly payment where they want to keep it. Um, and in terms of lenders, um, in general, I love all lenders that are local, um, but mortgage brokers tend to have more flexibility in terms of the kinds of loans they can offer people and the ways they can be creative and thoughtful about how they can help people. Um, and they can guide them to, to certain kinds of loans because they have broader portfolios to pick from. Banks are great, and there are, um, but they are a little bit more narrow sometimes in their focus. And this is just my experience. I'm not making like a sweeping statement about banks to be recorded for all time but um but it is <laughs> just so you know okay just bury it on the website um but there are a couple of banks that have tried programs and successfully done programs local banks um with um programs that have helped you know give incentives to people who are either first time home buyers or want to keep their interest rate really low at a time when all the other interest rates are really high. Um, financing is not something to be afraid of if you're a seller. You know, this is a whole education component that I don't know if it's addressable, you know, because, because realtors have to understand it and sellers have to understand it and some do and some don't. Um, but I, I, I don't know. Um, I make my living selling houses. So this is kind of a funny place to be, but, there, I, I just, there's so many barriers in, 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 et, to entry to, to people who want to buy anything. And when you look at these charts, you know where it changed the least, and you know where the price per square foot is the least in multifamily homes, which is interesting to me. Um, you know, I, I think what, I think what we need, I think we need programs that help, and I don't know how to get these, like, we need programs that help people with down payments. And we need people to know about them. Um, I just learned from a client that Smith Charities actually gives mortgages, which I never knew. Um, and I am not from here, but I grew up here. Um, we need uh, more. I think more of those first-time homebuyer programs would be helpful because those also provide in incentives um, to first-time homebuyers. Um, I think that the proposed, I know this is before the CPC, the community investment fund for home ownership is a good idea. Um, and for those of you who don't know, I think what it does, and I could be wrong, is that it um, it will ideally allow investors to park their money so that they can buy a, a multifamily unit and rent it. And that rent will go toward the purchase of the house by that 
by one of the two tenants unless they buy it jointly. I'm not, I may not be explaining it correctly, but it's something like that. I think that's a great idea, but it's like one house at a time and you're, in, you're competing in the open market against other people who are going to bid on multifamilies because people want to, people want to buy. Um, I was very curious about the, the um, houses that were built up on Burt's Pit Road because I know there was a raffle for those, and I know that it was there was so much interest in those. I'd be curious to know, perhaps from Laura, how many um, entrants there were in that lottery. Um, I would love it would be great if there was space to build more like that. And I don't know how how that went. I don't, but just something like that. Um, could we do more of that? Could we? I guess we can't. I thought maybe we could turn the old probate court building. I, my understanding was that it was going to be, um, what do you call it, surplused into some kind of affordable home situation, but it sounds like that is not that likely. Um, and, you, know, I, you know, in all honesty, I don't know what the answer is. I just know that we we can't, we can, I don't want to live in, a, I, I don't want to live, I bought my, my house cost $366,000 when I bought it which I don't care about saying because it's public record. And I would make a killing if I sold it right now, but I don't want to, um, cause, partly because I wouldn't have anywhere to go and partly because I don't want to participate in that way, um, even though this is my job, um, which is kind of weird. Um, I don't know what the answer is, but I'd like to be part of whatever the solution is. And I'd like to, I'd like to answer any questions I can answer and, and help in any way that I can. I just don't know how to. And I will, I will tell you that as a group, we realtors, at least the ones in my office, work really hard at our jobs and really care about our people. And we feel guilty a little bit all the time because we, we, we've all had those clients who are first time home buyers who get so excited about a house and they and they bid, make bid after bid after bid and they lose and, they, and you have to keep making that phone call to them and it and you, it breaks your heart um and it happens over and over and over and over so sorry to end on such a happy note um but i it's all been happy to help wherever i can it's all been very upbeat um so um so that's every everybody that's here so we so i'll let Derek. uh conduct oh, q a and oh, thank you this has been a great tag team Councillor perry could we have a short recess yes we could yeah it's five minutes right. yeah
I think we are ready to come back together and finish things up here. Thank you guys for your patience. And thanks for coming in. There is a gap on there if you want. I know. Oh my gosh. It's too much power for one time. Exactly. I'm going to ease into that. Come on back, everybody. We're back. We're back. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. And I want to thank everyone for their presentations and expertise tonight. And I didn't know, if, Carolyn, did you want to kind of wrap things up in a bow or before we go or, or to questions and answers or? I mean, I don't know if you all had questions for people who came or if there are any questions from out in Zoom world um, that um, you wanted to take, but I think, um, so I don't know if you want to check that first and then we can figure out what to do. There is a raised hand. Mm -hmm. Jacqueline's iPhone. All right. Jacqueline, if you would like to ask a question. Yes. Hi, everybody. Thank you uh, so much for being here tonight. Um, I really appreciate all the city staff and the panelists. So thank you. Um, I've been a resident for 45 years living on North Street in Ward 3 and um, am fairly new to uh, participating in city politics, but I'm finding the issue of housing very important to me. And um, in, in reading the uh, Donahue uh, Institute report and reading that um, there's that 3,572 unit shortage um, by 2025. And with Northampton's um, population being about 18% of uh, Hampshire County's population, uh, I think that the housing, un housing unit shortage in Northampton by 2025 would be about 18% of that 3,500, which is about 643 units. Um, so I wonder, you know, there's been the development on Hospital Hill, and I'm, I'm kind of curious if there is any kind of stats about how much of that 600 and let's just round it up to 650 units that say if Northampton's not going to be responsible um, for all of Hampshire County's housing shortage, uh, how much of the housing shortage that we're responsible for here in Northampton, uh, how much of that is left over? Um, so that's one question that I have. Uh, I guess I'll I'll stop right there and see if there's an answer that that could be spoken to for that. Does anyone have an answer for that? I know I don't. I don't. <laughs> I mean, I can comment on and then Catherine, if you want to. Well, I was just going to say, Jacqueline, thank you for your question. And um, that it, obviously Northampton doesn't have to take a certain percentage. I mean, it has to be a regional solution. So it doesn't you don't have to do the math that way. But um, but. Uh, then, then I will turn it over to the builders to talk about the actual challenges and Carolyn, whatever you want to add. I mean, I think the bottom line is we know that we need that people want to be living in Northampton. We also have a plan to um, where we we want we know housing growth will happen. And the question is, how do we want to direct it? We have just adopted a plan that says we want to be thoughtful and um about where that is because we want to reduce our carbon footprint. We want to provide housing. We want to be equitable and provide housing for people across the spectrum, both economic spectrum and um, you know all sort of facets of the community. We want to be inviting to people to um, be able to, the people who work in our community in our downtown, we want them to be also, if they want to, to be able to live in Northampton. So, um, you know, if we're trying to think about how we accommodate, even let's pretend it's 650 units in two and a half years, where is that housing going to go? Just sort of hypothetically, and where do we want it to go? And and so it's important to think about making sure that it's in places where we have the infrastructure where people can reduce their um, reliance on the automobile for every single trip that they want to take, that we're making um, places or uh, creating housing in walkable places, and that we also have opportunities for people from 
you know, across that broad spectrum. Okay. So you're kind of viewing it as we don't have any of that shortage provided for at this point. We're really at like sort of a blank slate with it. And we're looking to build, say, 650 units or whatever um, by 2025. Yeah, I mean, the city, the city's been, and I, I, Carolyn can obviously elaborate, but the city's been focusing a lot on accessory dwelling units. So if you think about the range, you know, there's 650. And if, 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 let's say 100 homeowners in the, in the city take advantage of the accessory dwelling units, so maybe there's going to be 100, you know, ADUs. And then there's going to be, there's a whole bunch of affordable housing or large multifamily housing that's out for bid right now. You could look at that. It's going to be a combination of, some ADUs, some multifamily housing, some uh, market rate housing, um, but 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 I'm understanding, and which I what I think I know across all of our communities in the Pioneer Valley is none of them have mapped out like we're going to have 50 houses and this is where they're going to go because the market does decides that we don't we don't have that kind of a government control in, in the United States. <laughs> right, right, and we we also don't we want to make sure that um, you know. We're not going to get out of this housing crisis through single family home development, and it's not the most energy efficient housing to, to be built anyway. And we know that there are opportunities in downtown, and we've changed the zoning to encourage, uh, through the form-based code, to encourage more types of multifamily housing. And there's a project that may get off the ground on King Street that would be 55 units. And um, But again, it's all dependent on the market and what's happening in, in that sector, but we want to make sure there are opportunities in each of the different locations in the community because, again, we're not just going to be able to accommodate people's desires and needs through one type of housing unit. Yeah, I'm really glad um, to hear you say that. I know, I, I, I think I have read from a report that Councillor Jarrett shared, and it was Correct me if I'm wrong, Councillor Jarrett, I think it was a study conducted in Eugene, Oregon, where it kind of showed where um, the housing was most economical in terms of, I think, sustainability and energy related costs. And so um, apartment uh, complexes looked like they were the most energy efficient. And as you sprinkle out into single family homes and you know you're spreading out further away from downtown centers um the costs of maybe it's maybe it's hvac costs I, i'm not quite sure but those seem to be um climbing and were the least efficient so as we have this aging population um, who can't necessarily walk to grocery stores even a short distance um I think it makes a lot of sense to have, and I, I know that you're doing this through the form-based code, um, but I'm glad to hear of the King Street uh, development or the potential development next to, I think it's Elizabeth Seaton or the Catholic Church there on King Street, um, because that type of apartment housing seems like it will be great in terms of providing a number of units, a uh, high number of units, and then also from an energy related standpoint, um, it seems to be the most cost effective. Councillor Jarrett, am I totally butchering that Eugene, Oregon report or do you know uh, what I'm I mean, your, your analysis is correct, but the Eugene, Oregon report, report had to do with um, the cost to the city for different types of development. So development, in multifamily development in in the center of town costs the city less than a sprawling type of develop, single family houses um okay. or it costs a city a municipality that was that what that analysis in eugene was thank you um yeah i think you know we all i i'm not a, by any means the voice for the entire group of um, Northampton citizens that are even just here listening to tonight's meeting. But, you know, we are not anti-infill. Uh, we know that there needs to be new development, that there needs to be housing, um, that there is a housing shortage. We are just really wanting to work with the city um, because we care about Northampton. We love Northampton. Um, we want to see 
it grow, but we also want to see that happen in a really um, responsible and highly sustainable way. And um, yeah, we just want to uh, be able to work with you and have our voices heard in um, being part of that process. So thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. I would throw two cents in just on the, from the building standpoint or from development standpoint. Um, you mentioned Village Hill. Um, was it Jacqueline? I can't tell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we were one of one of several uh, developer builders uh, at the North Campus. Um, that's totally built out at this point. Uh, TCB, the community builders, was w did some of the larger uh, multi multi uh, unit uh, build uh, build out there. Um, I would tell you that I'm aware of uh, several organizations that are working on this problem and have been for decades, and some of them are in the room. Um, and that, um, you know, Scott and I were talking sort of off camera here during the break. Um, there's some combination of public private um, investment um, and that could make these sorts of things possible. Um, and is it a for-profit venture or a non-profit venture? Um, there's models that have been used for decades. And um, and you heard tonight that those costs are not going down for, for you know, uh, non-profit type entities either. And so what's sustainable? And if you're already taking it out almost a hundred years, what what do we have to do? Do we push that out to 200 years or whatever? I mean, there's so there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, good baseline knowledge. Um, the numbers you've heard tonight are right on. I mean, we're seeing you know those those kind of costs per square foot, and we we see those coming down somewhat, but over the long term, those will continue to rise. And so the pressure of the money isn't it always about can we afford this, but um, if you look at, we were talking about Habitat for Humanity, you kind of look at what they're doing in the Valley and a number of houses, they've, they've, they've done more single families um, historically than they've ever done. Our experience is we've done more single families, but the truth be told, they're more of that higher end uh, cost-wise because of exodus from metropolitan New York and Boston and other places in the, in the U.S. Um, we've been working diligently and trying to crack the so-called affordable or model right and we did a we did a project in greenfield cheap side um and, and it didn't really pencil and we knew that and we did it anyway and the city gave us the property right um so it was it was sort of a a, a feel-good project um but that's not sustainable for builders that's not sustainable long term when you're for profit um and so uh you know how to collectively sort of lean in on this to figure it out and i think it's it's a pi private public i think it's jurisdictional i think that um more people live in an urban environment than they than they do in rural anymore and i think that you know there are other models on the planet that one can turn to um and you mentioned hvac as in terms of heating and cooling and what if uh, we're talking to uh, some folks at deerfield right now about a central heating plant that will take care of all town municipalities in a, in, a, in a ground source heat pump type system. So there's there's incentives out there. There's 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 federal and state funding. There's there are pathways to get it done. So it's not all doom and gloom, people. <laughs> yeah. Councilor Jared, thank you. Um, so multifamilies is it, it seem to be. I mean, if we look at the costs here per price per square foot. Um, this and now this isn't the building cost. This is what you're paying to buy them, but they are the cheapest. Um, and the costs, the, you know, the the list price versus sale price is coming down um, on multifamilies. But I mean, I guess my real question is more for those who are looking to build multifamilies. And is it is is our multifamilies the the uh, a way out of this faster than single families. Can you build them price per square foot less? Um, we know they're often smaller, so that they'll definitely sell for less. Um, just because you know the the actual you know unit sizes are smaller. Uh, but we you know we it's something we as a city we've passed zoning to try to encourage. I would love to hear kind of feedback about that. Um, one point of clarification is, I believe, the MLS 
reports include the cost of land in the square footage. Is that correct? Um, it's the whole package, what you're buying the property for. It's, the, it's an already built multifamily. Right, but I, even just across the board for all, whether it's single family condos or multi of these. Yeah, because these are already, yeah, the, the, the land is included because right. the, the structure is already built. Okay, so yeah, just for, yeah. just for everybody, yeah. I just want to make sure we're not conflating what Roger and I and Laura are talking about at, on a square footage cost may or may not include the land. And whereas these, these values may, and uh, that's like buying a car, right? A new car is a totally different price point than a used car. And so what's, what's on the inventory off what's out there in the market, those 300 and some odd houses that were sold, I would venture to guess the most of them are existing structures. Yep. Most yep. of them are existing structures. Um, however, what the MLS cannot tell me unless I, unless I spend you know, from now through Thanksgiving, pouring through every single listing is which of those existing structures came on a big enough piece of land that you could do. Um, you could either put an ADU on or you could build and, you know, you could, there was an infill lot there. So, yeah. Subdivide it. Yeah. So I can't tell that from this data. I mean, I could, I could scroll through every single listing, but it would take you know, it would take me a long time to figure that out. Right. Unless I, I mean, I can set parameters in a search for, you know, acreage and things like that and narrow it down that way. And I'd be happy to do that. But, um, and I, and I think we all know that there have been some sales of single family homes that had enough land that they became places where additional homes were built. So, so to get back to your question, um, you know, if you're building a new multifamily property or home, you would expect these prices per square foot to potentially go up. And as Laura said, even when you get into the much larger, she's still facing 350 to 400 a foot. And you're talking 30, 50, 80 units. So I think. Um, everything's relative. So yes, the the existing stock is a lower per square foot than than new construction. But within the realm of new construction, if you're trying to house people, mm -hmm. multifamily housing is going to be cheaper right. to build and cheaper to live in. Because in my apartment, I have only so many outside walls. In my single family house, they're all outside walls. And so, as a culture, we it's the home and garden channel generation like we got into an idea where everybody wants walk-in closets and bathrooms blah, blah, blah. so yeah if we you know having smaller more compact dwellings is going to be a faster cheaper way to house the most people and my opinion is until everybody has housing we shouldn't turn up our nose at any any strategy. Um, at Valley, we build a lot of these very tiny studio apartments for single people. And sometimes community members are kind of horrified that people are living in such small spaces. But again, until everybody has housing, <laughs> like let's set the bar as low as we possibly can. Once everybody's housed, let's make it better. But it, it we can't... Um, I just feel like that's a that's a frontline priority is to get people off the street into housing first and then talk about amenities after that. So so I would just just to close that. So I was kind of setting that up that, you know, I agree 100 percent with what Laura's saying. There is a difference between one, two, three family and going over that as it relates to code and a lot of additional expenses to the, that come in. And you absolutely get economies of scale for the reasons Laura brought up and many, many more. So, and, you know, me personally, I lived in multifamily housing for 10 years after college. So I think it's a, it's a cultural thing too, that, you know, getting, there's nothing wrong with it. And um, it's a good way to live, especially if you're in walking distance to downtown. Um, Can I pop one more bit in there? And that is just to echo the the economy of scale at scale, right? Um, but another thing that I want to just throw in the mix, and this goes to equity in housing. Um, and 
statistically the the median income and where are you there and so on and, and I alluded to this project that we did in Greenfield it was we were under the eight unit threshold there's some magic number under seven where a buyer um, with one rate and all the rest affordable are able to build equity in that property to then sell and or pass on to their heirs and if you think about the disenfranchised the Native American the the brown and black folks who have not had a pathway for a whole host of reasons over decades, I think that that has to be a priority in terms of anything that we do so that everybody has a has a piece of the pie, it's a fair share, and has a way of building that and passing it along, that equity along to family over, over generations. Um, I would kind of build on that, and uh, and I, I guess I'll toss that as I sort of thingy in my mind is more of a question for the builders um but i toss it out there for anybody one thing that i, I i'm i am consistently st struck by um for a number of reasons is the um it was mentioned that the the starter home that there and there was an article i think in the you know remember it was in the po washington post the new york times about um a few weeks ago about starter homes aren't a thing anymore and um and so sort of one i see a few issues about that in terms of um i mean i can imagine some reasons for that but i uh i a would ask the builders is that is there even any interest or even and and then also in terms of the market is there any reason to at the cost that it costs to build that traditional so-called starter home um is there a reason to do it? What What is there to say and to think about redefining what it means to have a starter home? And another thing that comes to mind um, that I think is particularly important here in Northampton, um, and so I'm Gen X, I look at the millennials, I look at the folks coming behind, and you have this delayed because of student loan debt and increased um, increased costs, you know, that, that folks are you know, younger people are delaying their um, marriages, starting their family. So, so you're not just redefining starter home, but you're also sort of redefining the place at which people can even begin to think about buying a home. And is that also another for reasons of equity, a reason to think about abolishing <laughs> the starter home? Um, but we can't do it without, right? It strikes me as something like you can't, you can't get rid of that as an ideal and aspiration for for people for young people without replacing it with something that's equally desirable which for me is in close sustainable reliable high quality housing um and things like that but i just wondered what your thoughts are on do we care do we care if that little that part of the market is going away but and if we do what replaces it we absolutely care about that. Well, I, mean, I don't mean like care like we don't care what happens to those folks looking for housing. But to be fair, I like I, I'm not. That's not what I mean. No, I know. I, like I, what? I wasn't being flip. I, but I, you know, there was a time when you bought a duplex, right? If you were, you know, my generation, you bought a duplex, you lived in half, you and you rented out the other, and that allow you to make that make that move up, right? Um, if zoning and and ordinance and 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 state and federal, uh, you know, building code allows for that sort of con uh, co combination of multiples living. ADUs are a great example for town. It's like we've had a lot of clients who um, want to stay with their younger children. And so they'll move out of the main house, they'll build the ADU, and they'll go live there. And so there's this coexistence. It's almost like a cultural thing with, you know, having multiple generations under a roof. And while well, code says you got to have fire separation, and you can't have two kitchens, and you, you know, so how do we, how do we sort of turn the statutory requirements around to allow for higher density, um, greater flexibility in that any any individual from, you know, knee high to elderly can come in and out of that building easily and, and live in various places. That is a structure that allows it to morph over time as those family needs change. And so um, I have young children, they're 30 somethings. Now, I guess they're not young anymore, are they? Um, and so how do they find their pathway in, right? I converted the back of my house as a concrete example. I converted the back of my house into an apartment, an ADU, and my son is there and he's paying the rent. 
it's great for me because I'm about to retire. I'm going to age out here, right? Um, but it allows me to be close to them, and yet they have their independence. So it's like that's working. I happen to be in a place where I could do that. Not everybody can. So it's like, right? Right. Well, and I have to say that I um, there's a lot I like about ADUs, and I like the flexibility it allows for family. I do, I am, it does concern me how it locks in generational wealth in a, in a circumstance of, uh, of reduced housing and opportunity in new entries to the market and, uh, and new in, both rental and buying and things like that. So I have mixed feelings about ADUs. Um, I don't have mixed feelings about the density. I have mixed feelings about that as a sort of a the big selling point for ADUs. Let's put it that way. Yeah, well, that's not very high density. You know, you're once it's one more unit. And so I think maybe the conversation is what's the what's in between? I mean, Laura and the higher density multifamily and the 60 units, that's one end. And then you have single families or ADUs at the other end. What are we doing in between? And how can we, you know, um encourage that as a as a way potentially as an entry way into the market if there's a four unit or an eight unit that then provides potential opportunity for eight you know singles or couples to um you know come into the market as a builder uh it i mean as a for-profit business the numbers need to make sense and when you widen the horizon, numbers can make more sense. So for example, if you own, I, I own multifamily residential and commercial property in town. If you start to run your, your projections over a longer horizon, you can justify things. If you're literally building to sell, uh, I think you're going to find that building small starter homes is going to continue to be a very difficult proposition to make them affordable, not technically affordable, but within reason, uh, because you do, you lose all of those and you still have to build a kitchen. You still need bathrooms. You still need a driveway. You still need these things. So you find that the per square foot price goes up and up the smaller the building gets. And again, not to say we shouldn't try, but I want to echo what what Roger's saying, it, it needs to be a public private intervention um, because unfortunately subsidies and uh, those monies are the only way these projects work it, in terms of uh, um, sustainably. These projects, meaning the sort of smaller starter home, single family starter home? Or a project like the one that Wright Builders did in Greenfield where you're you know, your end product, you're trying to produce something that's affordable for people, but the inputs don't change. Right. No so, matter how hard we work, we're using the same drywaller on that affordable project as we are on this million dollar home. This, we don't have choices to say, I got to take top shelf guy here, and this guy here. That's not how it is. So it costs the same, you know, re relatively speaking, depending upon quality, of course. Right. Yeah. Was was that project in Greenfield? Were those detached units, or were they they were like two two separate buildings? Um, I think there were three and four, three and one and four and another, and they were small. I mean, they were four hundred square feet ish. Yeah. There was like single bed, one bedroom. And I think there was one or two two bedroom units, but they were tiny. Um, I'm going to talk in code a little bit, not building code, but they were, they had no foundations. They were a slab on grade. They were one story. They had vaulted ceilings and high, high insulation levels. And they had, you know, air source heat pump for heating and cooling, but they're tiny. They're like Hinkley Street, but smaller. They are very similar to Hinkley. Yeah. And Hinkley Street's another one that we did. Um, <laughs> um, but those were like two units per, right. per building. Right. But little those are a little bigger hinkley is a little bigger right um, i mean to to answer your question i would like to see the existing pool of starter homes um there be some you know assistance for people who are looking at the existing pool of starter homes but in terms of everything that we're talking about i don't think it makes any sense to put to to build those because you can't you you just can't sell them for 
anything that makes them affordable to the people who who you would be building them for. So it's, I mean, but I, I think a two family or a three family where somebody can can buy it and then, or a group of friends, I've seen it, a group of friends buy it and they all three go in and they share everything and they figure out a place where all three of them can live. That's a different kind of starter home. And as, you know, this generation of, I don't, I get confused over what generation is what, whatever these 20 p 20s and up are like the 20 to 30s they're the ones who are job hopping they're the ones who are who are not staying i just had a conversation with my daughter they're not staying at the same job they're not staying in the same town they're not staying in the same place for very long so they i think they care less about having the home you know where they always come for the holiday or whatever so i think that the the culture is going to shift that as well Yes, Council Chair, but I need to step out for one moment to pass my keys. You guys can continue. I'm just going to go right here. Um, well, I think my question was what you're talking about in terms of multifamilies that build equity or condos generally, unless and we don't have co-ops, very many of them around here. Um, so, I mean, it seems like that's what we're talking about in terms of start the starter home now is is a condo where you can begin to build equity and then at some point shift over into a detached home if that's what you want to do the other choice seemed to be living in one unit and renting out the other um if you can get you know finance that is that accurate i would say that the issue with condos is that condo fees can be killers um for people you you have enough money to pay your you're paying your mortgage and you're paying your utilities, and you're paying your condo fee, um, and that that can drive people. I mean, I don't think of that. I've seen it as a starter home on really small condos. People don't stay long, and it's tight. It's really tight. And if I can add, and am I correct me if I'm wrong, Carolyn? But it's my recollection that 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 this was one of the big drivers for the zero lot line. Um, considerations that the fact that condo condoizing and the condo fees and the things that go into that um were problematic compared to just separate ownership on zero lot line structures is am i recalling that correctly i think excuse me yes originally the idea of zero lot line came i mean we were working with habitat actually and they were trying to get some synergies with um walls and things like that but there was a real need or interest in having that separate ownership so putting you know the property line division right down between the party wall allowed for that separate ownership <clears throat> Without all the added cost of right required for condos and right. things like that. Just very quickly, you know, Laura was saying, you know, get everybody in a house. And so maybe this this conversation about building equity needs to start with actually providing housing, whether or not it's an apartment or a condo or a home. Um, you know, again, I rented I I my first home I was 42 years old. I'm 46 now. I've had a house for four years and I rented until then. Um, and I know we we're getting long on time, but I have one more question um, that and maybe will come up again. And when we talk about uh, when we get into some sustainability issues and things like that in a future meeting, but um, I have been hearing, uh, so I'm also on the, um, uh, the Northampton uh, sustainability uh that commit commission committee i forget <laughs> energy and sustainability energy and commission commission right um i knew it was a c i just was having trouble with what the c stood for um but um one of the things that it seems like we keep coming up and i've heard this from a different a few different horses uh, sources is something that you mentioned which is that um electric the the hvac going all electric is um is actually in terms of cost wise is more uh expensive for the residents for the people actually living in those homes not just the building costs but that the the sort of the long term i i'd like to talk about that for a minute just because a i know that's true um as a as a dollars and cents matter the I, but how do like how we 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 still have to right like we have to hope for the for the the dose a the for the for the the higher fates, the federal fates, the states to 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 come in and 
build the grid out and make it based on sustainable, right? Like that's the hope. That's the only thing we've got in terms of right. Not so it's not, up it's fire not a commentary right? that we shouldn't go electric. It's a commentary that we need to understand the costs of doing it. And in the case of affordable housing, we need to subsidize that added cost. We can't just somehow pick it up, like keep the rents really low, but pay twice as much for heat. <laughs> like the math is not going to work for us. Um, and it's going to get worse. I think as people come onto the grid and there's a shortage of electricity, I mean, hopefully that will change over time. Um, but we're looking at, as I said, we're looking at geothermal for, for the project that we're working on now, because I am terrified of what it's going to cost to operate a building on scale that's all electric. And I just want to say that there isn't going to be in a shortage of electricity. I mean, th there is enough electricity planned and d designed and built, you know, the independent system operator for New England, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the federal government, we're not going to run out of electricity. And we are going to, to shift. We are decarbonizing. The Commonwealth has committed to that by 2050. Eversource has committed to that. I mean, the, the electric companies, the, the, the gas providers, like it's happening. So we're not going to run out of electricity. But Yes, of course, the costs are going up, but we're, we're going not going to run out of, and the, of, and of energy. The infrastructure hasn't caught up. And so there are mm -hmm. cases where we want to put solar, for example, and the and utility yet. company says we can't we can't absorb that um, flow. And that's, the system. A, that's a point of pressure that, that advocates need to make to the Department of Public Utilities because it's artificially constrained at this time in terms of regulations and control you know, for, for access to, to, to money by the utilities. But so, so there's an opportunity for much more um, expansion, but right, the regulations are, are limiting it at this time. I get very excited about this stuff and it, and it gets kind of nerdy. Um, so Laura, you're, you're correct in the sense that um, if, if everybody goes all electric, where is that electricity produced? Right. So if I don't have, a way to generate it on my rooftop, or I don't have some ground mount system, um, or I haven't coupled it with the earth so I can, you know, draw heating and cooling out of there. Where's it coming from? So is it coming from a coal-fired generator somewhere? Probably only as a as a last resort backup where we buy our power from in Massachusetts. Is it coming from Hydro Quebec? It's maybe some of it, depending on how they buy it year to year or five every five years. Is it coming from nuclear? Probably to some extent. Is it largely coming from gas fired generators somewhere, right? That happen to be older, dirtier technology, right? So in the near term, right? If we're trying to reduce carbon, this is all about reducing carbon, right? So we're not, somebody said burning and that's not with a sunblock to protect ourselves. Um, I think I think I said something about burning fiery flame. Yeah, of, yeah. Of True. earth, right? Yeah, but I don't wanna get, I don't wanna get too wonky here, but. The point is, I think you're, you're just spot on that in the near term, if we're connecting to the grid, which wasn't designed to be bi-directional, electricity moving in both directions, um, it's taxing the system. But the utility has known this for a while. This is not news to them. And they're working on this problem. And they're, and they're yeah, well, some are w willingly working on this problem. Um, national grid and uh, Eversource, right? Both foreign-owned electric companies, sorry. Um, they're they're working on the problem and they know it and uh, it's a big problem. But the other approach is to do nodal distribution of power. So if you can't generate it on your rooftop, can you generate it in your neighborhood? And if you can't generate it in your neighborhood, can you generate it in your municipality? And can you cut down on that distance from generation point to delivery point and so on and so on? So the cost of fuel is not going to go down. And that's that's the tipping point. It's the cost of gas and the cost of oil and the cost of coal will tend to rise over time. And we could bring out the charts to show that exponential growth in cost as opposed to electric generation. So I'll stop there, but we have to do it because it's a matter of necessity. The question is, how can we do it sort of like cracking this housing problem? How can we get all the group think together to figure out how to solve the problem? And it's it's doable. It's an oxygen. It's a nice foreshadowing for when we do get back together and talk about <laughs> these pictures.
Well, I, I do want to ask, I, I noticed that there are a number of city councilors who are in the Zoom, and if any of the councilors would like to speak up and say anything, I want to offer one last opportunity uh, for that. Oh, I see. Oh, there's, yes, Councilor Labarge. You have to unmute. Uh, You're muted. Wait. You're uh, muted, Marianne. Oh, she. she oh, there you go. There you okay, go. I'm all set. We can hear you now. We can hear you, Councilor Labarge. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Anyways, <laughs> um, I want to thank all the guests that are here tonight. It was a learning experience. Rachel, you asked about Portsmouth Road. Are you talking about the homes that are being built in Ward 6? Yes. Okay. The ones that are being built by um, the, the, uh, That's by the Habitat. Eight. That is Habitat. Three houses going up there. Those homes. No, not the not those, Marianne. The ones um, that are being built by the ADU company, the um, ones that there were a, a lottery for. That's not in Ward Six. That's Birch Pit Road. Yeah, it, it's, right, the, that's it's not my the, section. We have Habitat for Humanity on Birch Pit Road. We have Emerson Way, who apparently. Right could not afford keeping the, ch the two um, affordable houses there. And those have been brought down to add on along with Habitat for Humanity. In Ward 6, I have several, several homes and also condos by Habitat. And I am for affordable housing 100%. Habitat is building beautiful homes on Pertspit Road, a one bedroom, a two bedroom and three bedroom. We also have Smith Volk coming in now, their students and helping with the carpentry. They're doing a wonderful job there. And I've met all the new homeowners from Habitat and they're so happy to be able to own their own home. So I'm not quite sure where about you're talking about Rachel, but I just want to clarify the Brockton homes are absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, I mean, um, Council Barge is right. That's across from Emerson Way are the um, units that were um, Rich Matowitz um, contracted to build as the, the affordable units required from the subdivision, the Emerson Way subdivision. And that's required because they're subs because they're affordable units, they had to do the lottery system. I don't know how many uh, um, you know, people applied, but that was those are income restricted units. Right. And they're and um those are not habitat for humanity. Oh. There are some or are they uh, there are three some are, but the ones that you're seeing going in now are not habitat. Okay. Yeah. But there was a lottery for all of them? Yeah. Yep. Well, Habitat runs their own system. Right. But but the other ones, there was a lottery. Yep. It were the non-Habitat one. Yep. Is that all, Councillor Labarge? Yes, thank you. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. And, and I want to thank everyone for coming. I, I have some questions. This has been a great uh, roundtable session, but I am going to save my questions till the next time some of us meet. Uh, I think it'll be more appropriate. Uh, and we are running along the tooth, and I might turn into a pumpkin if I stay too long. Um, with that being said, Carolyn, would you like to say anything before you finish? Or yeah, I mean, I just I I reached out to all of you to ask you to volunteer your time, and I really appreciate it. I mean, after having um, conversations with the counselors, I know they were really eager to have just sort of bring. So, you know, a reality check to the issues that we're all hearing around in the community and, and wanting to make sure that we get, um, that everyone's hearing sort of the information that's affecting all of these um, concerns that people have raised. And so um, I can't thank you enough for saying yes when I reached <laughs> out for you to come. And it's been a long evening, but I think it's been really informative and helpful for everyone to understand sort of those 
elements that are part of and and um you know that we need to consider as a community in terms of how we're going to address housing which is such an important um piece of our community and wanting to make sure that we continue in being um a sustainable and welcoming and acceptable and accepting community for anyone and everyone who wants to be here so yes thank you very very much Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would move to adjourn. Yeah, it's second. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's too I like it. <laughs> and no, there's no new business. There's no new business, and there's no items referred. So, Laura, I, I, I well, say, all in favor. All in favor. <laughs> oh my God, I'm used to this. All in favor of adjourning. I. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad this is recorded. Yeah. <laughs>